Hi, I'm Tim Joyce, president of Sound Venture Productions. For well over 30 years, we've enjoyed a long track record of capturing some great moments in Canadian history. And we couldn't be more pleased to be leading a special centennial initiative with the wonderful people of the Blue Nose 100 Committee in celebrating the pride of Nova Scotia. This is a program that has been funded by the Government of Canada. Now, some of you may have already seen our brand new comprehensive website at bluenose100.ca. For those of you who haven't, be sure to check it out. Further to this, Sound Ventures' collaborative partnership with the Royal Canadian Geographical Society has generated a fascinating feature-length Blue Nose article and poster map in the March-April 2021 issue of the iconic Canadian Geographic magazine. We're also currently developing engaging educational lesson plans for the K-12 learning community with Canadian Geographic Education. All these captivating elements combined will rest assured inspire Blue Nose's fans new and old to open their eyes to the rich history and impact she's had on Nova Scotia, Canada, and on the rest of the world. In closing, Sound Venture looks forward to continuing to contribute to Blue Nose's centennial celebrations throughout 2021. In 1497, Italian explorer John Cabot, returning from a voyage to the New World, exclaims that the sea is so thick with teeming fish, they can be scooped up with a basket. The fish Cabot is boasting about is the Atlantic cod. The sea he's referring to is off the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, which is the largest of the 20 or so offshore banks. Why cod flourish in this area is because the banks are part of a series of shallow undersea plateaus. The plateaus range from 30 to 180 meters in depth and stretch almost 320 kilometers from shore before they drop off to 1800 meters or more. With the icy Labrador current, the warm waters of the Gulf Stream and the freshwater current of the St. Lawrence all colliding together over the banks, ideal conditions are created for the cod's favorite food source phytoplankton. With Europe's insatiable demand for fish, North America's eastern seaboard comes alive during the cod rush and for centuries provides European markets with thousands of tons of salted cod each year. By 1921, the year Blue Nose is launched, fishing off the banks is slowly transitioning from sail to steam. But still, even though Blue Nose is a fishing schooner designed to race, catching fish is how her captain, Angus J. Walters, and her crew earned their living, with all sharing the profits made from their catch. Life at sea is full of danger. Success depends on vigilance, luck, and tireless work in some of the worst conditions imaginable. Once on the banks, Blue Nose's crew bait their thousands of hooks and ready their 4.5 meter dories in the early hours of the morning before sunrise. The dory with its flat bottom is the reliable workhorse of the Grand Banks fishery. It can hold more than two tons of cod or halibut and is extremely seaworthy, empty or filled. Blue Nose comes equipped with 12 two-man dories. The fishermen must supply their own gear, which includes a full set of oil skins and their own pair of three meter oars. The dories are either launched as a flying release or dropped and tethered in a row behind her stern to be later released, or they're launched when Blue Nose is at anchor and fan out in all directions to cover 20 square kilometers of sea in one pass. For up to six times, the fishermen bring their catches back to Blue Nose and reset their hooks. The nights are spent cutting, splitting, and salting the fish before the fishermen can steal away an hour or two of sleep. Fishing off the banks is an incredibly hard way to earn a living. The only guarantees a fisherman has are sore muscles, a wet backside, and a little money in return. When two schooners head for home from the banks, a race surely ensues. And if one of those schooners is Blue Nose, the outcome is rarely in doubt. Getting back to port first means getting the best prices for her haul and coveted bragging rights.
In 1920, after the Lunenburg schooner Delawana loses to the Gloucester schooner Esperanto in the inaugural International Fisherman's Cup race, the wind is seemingly taken out of Nova Scotia's sails. This devastating loss accelerates the building of more than a half a dozen stunning schooners in Nova Scotia shipyards. The soon-to-be-famous Blue Nose, designed by Dartmouth naval architect William J. Rui, is one of them. In shipyards from Essex to Boston, the same is true, as American shipbuilders craft their next cup challengers. The ultimate goal for each of these new schooners is to win the next International Fisherman's Cup race in 1921. But why did Blue Nose succeed when all others failed? One of the main reasons is Rui designs a fishing schooner that will be fast, but first and foremost, more than capable to fill her holds with fish to earn her keep. Because she has to fish the Grand Banks early in 1921 to be eligible to race in October of that year, Lunenburg shipbuilders at Smith & Ruland work 10-hour days for $2 a day, 6 days a week, and masterfully piece her together in 97 days. A golden spike is driven into her keel, and coins are placed under her masts for luck. Are these some of the more romantic reasons that made her a winner? Blue Nose's captain, Angus J. Walters, has his own theory. According to Captain Walters, Blue Nose is different than any other vessel that ever came out of Lunenburg. Because of the way her masts are placed, she is perfectly balanced. And the reason she'll win is because of her speed and her magical ability to sail into the wind. Blue Nose is designed to race two to three weeks a year, but she's being built to fish six months of the year. Captain Walters insists that her foredeck be raised to provide more headroom for her crew. Even though Rui felt this design change might slow Blue Nose down, he revised her lines to raise the bow by 45 centimeters, giving Blue Nose her distinct look. But perhaps the real reasons behind Blue Nose's incredible legacy will always be attributed to William Rui's outstanding design the craftsmanship of her builders, Captain Angus Walters' superior seamanship, and the huge hearts both Walters and Blue Nose possessed. On January 28, 1946, Blue Nose, having been sold to haul freight in the Caribbean, strikes a reef off Haiti. She is abandoned and later sinks. And any last opportunity to preserve this national icon and unifier of nationhood is sunk along with her. Fourteen years later, in 1960, Smith and Ruland the very same shipbuilders who built the original Blue Nose builds a replica of the bounty. As another movie, Captain's Courageous rekindled the romance of the Golden Age of Sail, which resulted in the resurgence of the International Fisherman's Cup race in 1938. Ironically, mutiny on the bounty has a similar effect. Lunenbergers believe a replica of Blue Nose would be a great tourist attraction. Halifax's Oland Brewery, looking for a mascot for their schooner beer brand, puts up the money. Smith & Ruland builds her, following William J. Rue's original plans. On July 24, 1963, Blue Nose 2 is launched with Captain Angus J. Walters, the original captain of Blue Nose, sailing on her maiden voyage. For more than a half a century, Blue Nose 2, in the hearts of many Nova Scotians, is not just a replica. 
She is the embodied spirit of the original Blue Notes. She's a living connection to her namesake's glorious past as the reigning undefeated International Fisherman's Cup race champion, although she herself will never race. Blue Nose 2, like the Blue Nose before her, is an iconic symbol of Nova Scotia that distinguishes the province from all others. She serves not only as a goodwill ambassador for Nova Scotia, but also for Canada at large. When Blue Nose 2's crew gathers for dinner on board, they sit around a table pieced together from wood and stone collected from every Canadian province and territory. During the summer, she routinely visits ports around Nova Scotia, Eastern Canada and New England, occasionally traveling further to ports along the St. Lawrence and Great Lakes attracting huge welcoming crowds wherever she goes. An opportunity to feel her legacy to a bygone era beneath your feet and salt breeze on your face awaits, as anyone can join Blue Nose 2 on a harbor cruise in her home port of Lunenburg or in one of the many ports she visits. If you're unable to attend, just hold the Canadian dime tightly in your hand and imagine.